Hi, uh, I'm Matt Kelly. Uh, there's going to be a few visuals in here, so uh, you won't have to read so much text, hopefully. Um, but the project for the incentive award that I did was visualizing digital collections of web archives. Um, so the problem we basically wanted to solve is um, for sites that uh, when you put a URI into something, you don't know necessarily what you're going to get back. And if a, a site has been archived over time, uh, the site likely changes. Um, so what we want to do is try to get the aboutness of the site that's changed over time. So in this case, with Apple, how it's changed drastically uh, over the maybe uh, uh, 20 years that it's uh, existed. So, uh, but if we try to do that for every memento that we have, Apple has about um, 17,000 mementos in our archive alone, not counting the other archives. Um, so trying to do this for all of uh, these different screenshots um, is very expensive. Um, in addition to that, there's also many redundancies, as you can see uh, from the ones that are circled here. Um, there, it's not necessarily useful to see these redundant mementos when you're trying to get a summarization for what the site has been about over time and how it's changed. Um, so there's a couple different methods of summarization that you can use to do this. You can include all the mementos, as I said before. It's uh, very expensive, both temporally, spatially, and uh, cognitively expensive to actually look at this uh, collection of many different screenshots and try to get uh, what the uh, gist is of how it's changed. Um, but if you uh, try to randomly pick uh, uh, mementos uh, from the collection that you receive, um, you end up missing important captures that are, that are representative of how the page has changed. Um, in addition to that, um, doing image uh, differentials, trying to figure out how the page has changed by comparing every single uh, memento um, is uh, very temporally expensive to generate all those, but also to do the image differential. So what we actually came up with in our research um, was to take the text content of uh, these different mementos, uh, compare them, and uh, come up with a summarization based on the HTML of the pages. Um, so in the case of this, uh, this individual Apple memento that you see here, um, we can crawl that and we can get solely the HTML without having to fetch all the other resources that are associated with it. From that, we generate a sim hash value. A sim hash value is a means of uh, uh, sort of fingerprinting the, uh, uh, the markup in this case, but it's meant more to um, uh, identify similarities between different text contents rather than uh, differences like other hashes. So uh, let me go over sim hash a little bit. So if you have an HTML snippet here, it actually chops up the HTML uh, and generates a single character for it. So in this project, we use a 64-bit sim hash to compare to different mementos. Um, and so uh, in this case, this memento would be represented by C3 and many other characters than 9F on here. Um, so comparing sim hash to a couple different hashing algorithm algorithms, in the case of MD5, you have two things that are very, very similar here. So the top one, you see a bunch of A's there uh, with the blue A, a highlighter, and the B in the second one that's the same string, you get a radically different uh, strings as outputs in it. So comparing um, conventional hashes to sim hash, you actually want to uh, find the similarity between them rather than uh, identify uh, uh, subtle differences. So in sim hash, you see the A that's uh, represented there uh, generates a C3 character, but if you run that same string uh, with the B substituted, uh, you get the A4, but you get very, uh, uh, you get similar uh, other characters in the results for it. So the basis of this is if we have two different uh, HTML pages and they've changed over time to be able to uh, identify the similarities between these different mementos, um, we can identify the parts that have changed and if they've gotten past a certain threshold then they've, no, they've changed uh, to a sufficient degree to warrant them being included in summarization. Um, so, like I said, we want to identify the uh, similarities rather than the difference in this. Um, and we, uh, we want to remove the uh, redundancies that we saw in the uh, 17,000 uh, Apple screenshots um, by uh, using the basis that if the sim hashes are very similar, then it's likely that the screenshots are going to be fit very similar and not contribute uh, uh, to the aboutness of the page uh, in the summary of the page how it's changed over time. Um, so, uh, per the sim hash that we saw before, if we have these four different mementos for apple.com, uh, what were, you can see the subtle differences in here, but if we actually highlight them in here, uh, you can see that if we have a, a, a sim hash, if we have a, a threshold to be of differences, we call the hamming distance in here. So hamming distance is merely the, uh, the change in uh, two different strings as they've compared. So in the uh, top one, we use that as a basis, so the pivot in that case. So in the second one there, uh, the second memento from uh, March 5th, 2008, we see two different characters of change, but that's not enough to pass our threshold of four characters changing in a 64-bit sim hash to, to uh, warrant including that, uh, that memento in the summary. So in the third one, you can see that one character has changed from the pivot, that D, uh, whereas it's uh, compared, April 12th is compared to March 3rd rather than March 5th, since March 5th isn't included in the summary. And finally, um, on October 4th, 2008, the sim hash uh, has changed drastically. So in that case, that would, uh, uh, would be the first memento that you'd want to include in the summary uh, beyond the pivot value. So in this case, we would include for this one uh, as a partial uh, representation of the time map 
uh, the March 3rd, 2008, and the October 4th, 2008, and any other ones that passed this threshold of hamming distance. Um, so to kind of visualize the hamming distance threshold, um, whenever it passes uh, the little dotted line there um, with a sliding pivot basis, uh, then it is included in it. So the red circled ones, uh, as we saw before, memento three would be included, and then everything subsequent to that until we included another memento uh, would be um, uh, based on uh, memento three as, uh, as its pivot. So we'd have memento three, memento six, and memento ten in here. Um, so to sort of explain that a little better, um, it shows that we use a sliding pivot in this case. So uh, everything prior to memento three would be based off of some initial pivot. So since it's a partial time map, we'd have something before, and uh, we include the first memento to, as a representation of uh, being included in it since we need, need a pivot to calculate um, the Hamming distance. Um, so our project goals for this were we were taking this concept to develop a, uh, uh, to develop a, a means of summarizing um, URIs in the archive. So to do this, we, our, our products of this, uh, this grant were to develop a web service, a Wayback add-on, and an embeddable version, so you can actually use this on your own URIs, and we've done that, and I'll demo it here, as well as some uh, screencasts that can show you that it does, in fact, work. Um, so uh, the name that we actually came up with this was called Al Summarization. Um, this is uh, the works based off of Ahmed Al Sum's uh, ECR uh, 2014 paper. Uh, regarding thumbnail summarization techniques for web archives, so it's al sum plus summarization is al summarization. It just works. Um, so, uh, as an example, uh, the uh, another one of the PIs on this project, Dr. Nelson, whom many of you know, will use him as sort of the uh, the base case for what's included here. So, what it actually looks like here is, uh, oh, I guess that's not going to come up. Yeah, it is. So, this it, we have three different visualizations in this. So you can come at it from different perspectives. So, this one we're actually showing because it looks pretty cover flow. Um, so the cover flow, if you've seen it in iTunes before, it, um, it makes it look really pretty, but it's really hard to see uh, what you're getting for the, um, for, for the thumbnails. So we allow other presentations of the same data from it, but if you actually want to show something to your site, say, hey, this is how my site looked over time, and you can navigate this thing, you can, uh, you can chose to use, and they'll be more impressed than something flat in this case. <laughs> um, so uh, Dr. Nelson's page would look like this in here. So to identify sort of the parts of uh, this visualization, we have the temporally sorted mementos it from the archives were returned, uh, the, the temporal uh, sorting of it. The ones that are included uh, in the visualization here are the ones that have been selected to be sufficiently different uh, from, uh, from one another past that hamming distance threshold to be included in the summary. So despite some of those on the left that you're seeing still have, has his avatar there, uh, the textual content was enough to uh, to uh, pass the Hamming distance threshold to include it in the summary. Uh, below the uh, visualization, we have some metadata about the memento itself, uh, the URIM there, as well as the memento date time, the sim hash value that we developed in the Hamming distance threshold. So you can see that this one here that is actually highlighted in the middle uh, had a Hamming distance threshold of four. So it just met that requirement to be sufficiently different from the previous pivot to um, be included in the summary. And finally, on the bottom left there, we have uh, three of uh, uh, potentially uh, extensible a number of visualizations for the same data. Uh, all these three use the same data, so it doesn't have to go back to the server to perform this process again. And I'll show you a little bit more about what those different visualizations of the same data, some of which are more effective, and some give a little more information as to the aboutness of the page over time. Um, so we, uh, the service that we set up to do this, we have uh, two different parameters in addition to the URI R that you, were, uh, URI R that you would specify, URI being the live web uh, URI, the, the URL that you type into your web address. So we have the access parameter. So if you want to get this visualization here, we have the three different um, uh, means of showing the data. You use interactive one, or you just don't specify anything at all because these are optional. Embed allows you to actually include this uh, service, the product of the service in your website. So you can see uh, how your site has changed over time using these visualization aspects simply by including a little code snippet in here. You can <coughs> utilize this service in the web. As well as Wayback, we uh, create an extension to Wayback that actually allows you to do this uh, for the contents of a Wayback Machine instance um, and uh, use that as a basis for um, showing the contents uh, for that URIR. Uh, as, in addition to that, we also investigated a couple other strategies, some naive, uh, some not so. The alsumerization strategy, which we have developed in this research. Uh, the yearly uh, allows you to actually go through and uh, pick one per year. Um, and then backfill that uh, until we have enough methods to, uh, to pass this threshold. So you'd go, if it started from 96, you go 96. If it didn't have any 97, you wouldn't have any then. 98, you'd pick one, and you keep going until you get it, and then you'd backfill enough from the most current ones until you get it. That's just another summarization strategy. Uh, the skip list that actually picks uh, every K memento. So if you have the time map and you want to pick every fifth memento, you can go and do that. Again, these are naive strategies, but we're comparing them, them against our sim hash based uh, strategy to uh, sort of get a basis for what should be included in summarization, as well as random. Basically, you have a bunch of mementos and you want to pick random ones and see if that beats our strategy for it.
Um, so to actually do this, you, you can set up a service. This is all open source software, and I'll explain that a little more right here. Uh, you pass the parameters via the query string. In this case, you say access equals way back, and URI R equals Dr. Nelson's site. If we wanted to specify another parameter, again, the, every, everything but the URI R is optional um, because there are smart defaults in this. Then you can pass access equals way back and strategy equals random. In that case, you get the way back interface to this service as well as using the random strategy. So these are really easy to toggle in there and as well as there's an interface that makes it so you don't have to type anything in the URL bar, but um, it makes it pretty simple to interface with this service. So sort of the inner workings of the service is the user goes to, uh, goes to the web browser, um, types in one of the URLs you saw before, it sends a request to the service, the service then goes to, uh, in this case, is Internet Archive, that's Terra 2, but really any Memento compliant archive should work uh, for it, is you can basically change uh, one value at the beginning of the code and use it for your own archive or your own uh, local instance of Wayback. Um, and so from that URIR that the, the user requested to it, uh, the service then goes and queries the archive to get all the mementos for that uh, uh, URIR. So what's returned is a time map full of URIMs, and so the service takes this and starts churning on it. And what it does is it goes and fetches the HTML of all these different mementos, which is a fairly temporarily expensive uh, operation. Um, but in doing that, you get a better summarization for it. So that's the most expensive part that we're still trying to get over for it. But basically, it has to go through every single one just to get the text contents, but then it can cache it. And from there, it's uh, from the service side cache, uh, it can uh, uh, overcome that, that limitation on it. So once it has that, it generates a sim hash for each of these mementos in the time app. Um, and from that, it calculates the hamming distance that we saw before, tries to figure out the mementos that pass the th threshold. In this case, the, uh, the first and the fourth one pass it. And again, this is a very small time app. Uh, for uh, what some of the sites that come back. So in this case, five mementos is, is um, you know, uh, ho our homepages have more than five mementos in the archive at this point. So this is sort of a, a subpart of uh, the time map. So, um, so before actually creating these thumbnails for the screenshots, a preliminary interface is returned to the user that has placeholders. Since we already know how many Im images are going to be in the summarization, we can set up this visualization and then populate it asynchronously um, as the th thumbnails are generated. So. Uh, uh, to give kind of the uh, response, response design to the user, uh, we return the visualization with the placeholders on it, and basically you can have all the metadata for it, just the images aren't generated yet. And then the service goes, and this is all, the user doesn't have to do anything further. Everything's populated after this. It goes and generates uh, uh, thumbnails for each of the mementos um, that it had previously chosen to include in the summarization, using PhantomJS in this case, but you can pl uh, plug any, uh, uh, any one of your um, screenshot generating services that you want here, basically just pass it through a parameter um, because you already know the URIMs in this case. Once those are generated, and really uh, the thumbnail generation ironically uh, takes less time to complete than uh, the sim hash generation, um, but uh, it's, it's one of those things that is just uh, expensive processing up front, but more benefit in the end, you only need to do it once. So it's a lot of overhead for it. So once uh, we have all the screenshots or the thumbnails, we return that to the interface and it's asynchronously populated. So you see all these things start popping up on here that were previously placeholders and you get the full interface. Uh, mind you, all this stuff is cached, so it's just uh, initial expense up front. And then once you have that, then it doesn't need to be regenerated again. So to, to accomplish this, we used uh, Node.js for it. Uh, it's a, a framework that allows you to uh, uh, to be, it's a very, very synchronous JavaScript-based framework that's meant for a server-side thing, but it handles um, re requests very, uh, without necessarily getting bog bogged down on a single sort of request. PhantomJS to generate the screenshots. Again, you can substitute yours of choice. Um, when we coded this up, we um, made it very modular and uh, very semantic so we can reuse a lot of these uh, memento abstractions that we have in here. So we're hoping to take uh, these memento abstractions that we coded up in JavaScript and uh, apply them to some other projects that we have uh, since it already uh, kind of has the interfaces that you'd have uh, on memento objects without having any, um, any too tight coupling with the service itself, as well as that it's, uh, it's an open source project, so everything's documented in the hopes that we'll get some pull requests and improve the service to make it more useful for other people. So again, fork me on GitHub, please. Um, so to actually install the service, um, if you've never, you, first you'd actually install Node on here. So you install Node on your service, uh, on, your, on your PC. You can run this on, on your PC or a server. Um, to install the dependencies, npm install installs everything that uh, needs to be included for this, and you simply type node out summarization, um, and the service is up and running. So you actually get the output uh, on the bottom here that just gives you kind of information on how to access it. So uh, in this case, if you want to do it from my own site, you'd simply go to that URI in the browser. And that's just something because I uh, installed it on uh, local host to show it. So it basically tell you what host you need to go to, where you have to go in your, uh, in your um, web browser, or where you need to curl, or however you want to interface with it, um, that's where you need to go for it. So a little bit about this uh, online versus offline generation. Uh, the, a lot of the expenses in the online generation is basically you're doing this on the fly as the users come, but you can pre-generate a lot of this stuff and amend these, um, uh, these uh, sim hash uh, caches that you get back because it's going to, for the most part, just uh, be included on the end 
uh, basically appended onto the sim hash cache. So uh, if, say, you, uh, you do it one day and then a year later you go and you want to get another summarization for it to include uh, this new fancy design you have on your website um, that you've archived through one of the various services, um, you can run it again and it will go and fetch the updated time app and amend. Uh, it will know that you already have uh, the sim hash for all these and not do it again and amend uh, your sim hash cache and you basically have to generate one more screenshot because everything else stored on the server. Uh, where, where the service is located rather on your machine or anything like that. Offline summarization in contrast um, is uh, where you actually pre-generalize stuff. You, you feed it a, a big list of URIs. You basically say, I want th sum thumbnail summarizations for uh, say all these um, URIs in the Alexa 500. Um, and I, I want to make sure that I I'm expecting people to come and look at these summarizations. So uh, I want to pre-generate these. So that's capable of doing this machine as well and it makes it so uh, it's not necessarily on demand but it makes it so it's more responsive. Uh, whenever someone comes. If they come and they enter a URI that isn't include that, it will uh, default to online generation and then you'll have that within your data set. Um, there's a couple of different adaptive strategies. So generating all these, uh, these sim hashes is extremely expensive. So there's actually, uh, by default, if you don't specify a strategy, it will first try out summarization. And if there's a certain threshold of mementos um, where it's gonna take like hours to generate it, it will um, go to a naive strategy um, and actually do something like, uh, like random and give you back a summarization. Um, to get over that, you can actually explicitly state that you want out summarization and it will go and grind for those hours to go and generate all these uh, uh, screenshots. But it gives sort of a, um, uh, a way to be adaptive and more usable in this case. So if you just want to get something up real quick and you want to see it, you can do that. So um, uh, the other different strategies I talked about before, the random strategy where you pick the K to mementos and we get a uniform selection uh, over, over the whole time map. The interval, every, every mth memento we get, uh, we pick a, we, we pick that and include that in the summarization and a temporal interval where we go out year, year, year uh, until we have enough mementos and if we need to, we backfill it from the current. So uh, when we were compa comparing it, we did a couple studies on to uh, what is uh, more, than, uh, more than sufficient com cognitive load to look at a bunch of thumbnails where that threshold and it's about K equals 15 for anything above that, then, uh, then it's kind of hard to see, uh, to visualize those all at once. For example, that the Apple uh, one where you had maybe a, maybe 120 mementos at the beginning, it's hard to really see uh, which ones are the unique ones if they all look similar in this case. So to be able to uh, take this all in at once, uh, one of the findings were um, not from ours but from previous work and we use that as the basis as K equals 15. So in this case we compared uh, Dr. Nelson's homepage over time to a couple of different strategies. Um, so on the right you can see uh, the grid view which is a little more um, informative than the cover flow view. Um, which is not as pretty, of course, and this won't attract people to your site versus the cover flow view, but it's, it allows you to see the summarization a little better. So, um, see the one on the left is the random strategy, and um, despite uh, the randomness, you still get a lot of those very early mentos. Again, these are temporally sorted, so you get the big red page in the top left um, for the random strategy, which were just picked because of uniform randomness. Um, but in our strategy of summarization, you can see that uh, those very similar mentos were not included in the summary because they were uh, they did not pass the thre threshold to be included. So there's only one of those because the page basically didn't change. Um, you can see some of the other mentos, for example, the one uh, in the top row, uh, third and fourth uh, column there, um, looked very similar, but the, somewhere on the page there was an, enough of a difference for it to actually be included a second one. So maybe he was doing a little change on the footer or maybe some of the text content that made it look different. Um, but you can see that uh, some of the other uh, ones nearby, uh, if you look a little closer, you can see that each uh, consecutive memento looks uh, slightly different than the last one, if not drastically different, versus the previous one, you see identical consecutive mementos more frequently. So that's just for the random strategy. So if you actually use, uh, use the interval strategy, you get a similar thing. Um, because he kept that page over time, you're getting, um, uh, you're getting sorry, the intervals every, every, every kth memento, you're getting the, the same ones over and over again. So ideally, the interval and the temporal interval should, should match up uh, in the end. Um, so in the temporal interval, you get something very similar, um, just basically because he had that same page for the longest amount of time, um, you get the same screenshots over and over again. So again, these are very naive strategies, but because he had such a high concentration of these same mementos in there, um, our method actually uh, uh, does not include those in for good reason, because they don't actually uh, give you any information about the aboutness of the page. I've got the asynchronous polling, and you can see this on here. I'll actually demo this live so you can see it because um, I think that'll be more useful. We got way back integration, so it looks like in here, and that's fully customizable. Um, and uh, how you would include it in the service embedding, as well as um, you can include it in page using object or iframe from HTML5. Uh, the code base is available here. Um, there's actually a live service up where you can use it for your own if you just wanna put an embed on your site and try it. And I'm going to try a very quick live demo because I am short on time. So um, this is the different visualizations you can go through here. 
And again, this is live. You can see it's on the web on a, actually it's a Docker instance. So if you want to run this on Docker, you can. We still have to do that. Uh, we have the grid view as well, which is a different view. You can get the metadata by clicking on these and, and see that sort of thing. As well as we got a uh, timeline display here where you can actually zoom in and get the concentration of mementos over time. So, and these are supposed to be little thumbnails, but uh, something is broken in the code. So yeah, you can see uh, Dr. Nelson had a lot of pages around. Those red ones that you saw before were uh, like uh, 2003 or something like that. And because of that high concentration, you got a lot of red ones in the more naive strategy. So with that, I guess I'm done. Hi, I'm uh, Michelle Weigel, and uh, I am um, going to talk about this project um, that was um, primar primarily, you know, the work is mostly done by our PhD students, so by uh, Yasmin um, and joint work with Michael Nelson. Um, and first off, I want to thank again uh, Columbia University Libraries and the Mellon Foundation for um, uh, funding this work. Um, we uh, uh, appreciate any time that we can get support for our PhD students um, to uh, further their uh, dissertation work and, and, uh, and further their uh, academic careers. So thank you. So our large title of the project was Tools for Managing Seed URIs. And the real title, um, what our, the tool that we built, was a tool to help you detect off-topic pages in your uh, collections. So we've all heard about uh, Archive It today, and you know, many of you are very familiar with this service. So they host these curated web collections. Um, and so here's the user view if you want to go and, and look at Archive It. And if you're a curator, here's your view. So, um, and we saw this when the Start Crawl Now button got pressed. Um, and so what Archive It lets you do is you specified your seed URIs. Uh, for your collection. And then you can specify how frequently or how deep uh, you want these crawled. And then, you know, archive it goes off and crawls and, you know, you can start these in 2005 and come back 10 years later and want to analyze it and there's, there's still data there. But they, um, uh, archive it also gives you nice tools to be able to look and see what's in your collection, what have you collected. Um, there are things here shown uh, in this image on file type. Um, you can also get information about when pages are 404. Um, but the thing that we wanted to look at is uh, the aboutness of the page. So when has the page gone off topic from that original seed that you wanted in your collection? So this is you know, basically aimed at curators in uh, how to, you know, maybe there are pages you want to take out of your collection because they aren't. Uh, reinforcing what your collection is about. So we all know that pages can change through time. Um, they can have subtle changes, but they can also just go off topic. And so this is a page from the Egyptian Revolution and Politics uh, site, and this is one of the presidential candidates uh, of, the, of that time. Um, and uh, later there was a database error, and then um, uh, Yasmin promises that this Arabic says there was a financial problem. Um, then it came back on topic, they got everything fixed, but it had a site redesign. Um, then the site was hacked, and currently the domain has expired. So from this um, one uh, page, over 60% of the archived versions uh, at Archive It for this page are actually off topic. Um, now, if you're a curator, you may want to save the version where the page was hacked. That might have some historical uh, value for you but you probably don't want the database error, you probably don't want the financial error, and I'm sure you don't want the domain has expired error. Um, so how do you find these? And you know, this can be a problem in, in your, your pages. So social media pages can also go off topic, we found. So this is one from the Occupy collection, and a little bit later it redirects just to Facebook.com. So either the account was taken down or made private or, or something, but you can't access uh, this page. And the thing that the crawler grabs now is just the you know, Facebook.com template. So what do uh, th these web pages look like over time? So we've been introduced to this uh, terminology before, but just one more time. So a time map is the list of a URI's mementos. And I'm going to use the, the memento and time map terminology here a lot. So all of the times that this page has been captured. 
And so when we were looking at how these time maps change, we identified five different classes in terms of is it on topic or is it off topic. Uh, we have always on, uh, stem function on where it starts on topic and then goes off topic and remains off topic. Step function off where it starts off topic and then becomes on topic. Oscillating, like the example I showed where it goes on and off. And then always off. So yes, there are some pages that this, the seed was just bad, so it never um, actually was on topic. And we have real world examples of, of all of these uh, here on the slide. So just a, a, a couple quick examples. So the step function on, this is about the Egyptian revolution, and then at some point uh, the domain registration is lost. And actually if you see, the number of mementos in the red boxes are greater than the number in the green boxes. Um, so you have a, a lot of uh, mementos here that are, are not gonna be on topic for you. Um, another case we have is um, an oscillating site. And so we saw the one previously where there were errors in the site, um, but there are also just topic changes. So this is the time map from the BBC's Middle East page, uh, and this is from the U e Egyptian Revolution uh, collection. So maybe the curator only wants those BBC pages that show the Egyptian Revolution on the front page. This page actually talks about all sorts of stuff. So we've identified some places where it was about Iraq or Syria or Palestine. But then it came back and there were certain places where it was actually about Egypt. So the curator may want to call those that are not uh, directly about Egypt, even though there's nothing wrong with the page itself. So what we found is we looked at, um, I think this is from about 15,000 mementos um, from three collections that we looked at, um, and we found that most time maps are always on. So that's good. So they're, they're there, but there's a pretty significant number where these off-topic uh, pages sneak in. So 8 to 11 percent were step function on, so something has happened to the page and you have a, you know, generous set of off-topic things, and if that page is still being crawled, you're continually adding uh, to the number of off-topic uh, mementos. Um, a few step function off, and then also a pretty significant number of these oscillating ones. Um, and these oscillating ones are going to be difficult to find by hand, um, because you have to go in and look at every single memento uh, to figure out uh, what's going on. So this is what our tool is here uh, to help you identify. Uh, and note that, you know, a very small percentage, just a couple, we found that were always off. So uh, what types of different ways can we detect these off-topic pages? So. So the first thing we need to do is we need to go from an archive collection to terms because we're going to use the terms in the web page to figure out if the memento is on topic or off topic. Um, so we grab the seed URIs from the front end of archive it and we get the time map uh, of these seed URIs from the CDX file. Now a note that we have a, at ODU we have a, um, uh, essentially a mirror of uh, archive it from about 2003, and so we're doing our processing for these experiments on our local copy. Um, so then after you get the time maps, we get the HTML from the work files, use the boiler pipe library to extract the text, and then we do, you know, your typical uh, term uh, uh, analysis um, using a couple libraries uh, and stemming and stop word removal. We looked at six different similarity metrics. So we looked at ones based on textual content. We did the TF-IDF uh, and did cosine similarity of that. We looked at the intersection of the 20 most frequent terms, uh, jacquard similarity coefficient. Um, then we also looked at a semantics-based uh, version, basically um, with the eye towards something like that BBC site where you know, it's not gone down, uh, but the, the topic itself has, has changed. Um, and then also a couple of structural uh, uh, differences. And I'll show a couple examples here. So for textual content, um, we had the, these three methods. And so these are two of the pages from uh, the presidential candidate I showed before. And we're always comparing to that first memento. So we um, compare 
you know, a candidate memento to the first memento. This one, um, the similarity uh, between these is pretty high. The, we have different values for the different methods. Um, when we go to the one where the domains expired, now we do the text similarity and it's zero for all of them. So that's kind of an obvious candidate. Um, the other thing we wanted to look at was on pages um, like, for example, the BBC, you may have pages that are on topic, but they don't exactly share um, the top terms. So if you had a page that had Tahrir, Egypt, and Army, and a page that had Cairo, Morsi, and protest, you and I would realize that those are still on the same topic. Uh, but we needed to find a way so that the algorithm could realize that those were the same topic. Um, so what we did is we submitted these terms to the Bing search engine API and grabbed the snippets that resulted. And then we took that snippet test and did the tokenization in terms and then reran a similarity measure. Um, and so here we're able to get 0.7 similarity uh, between these two pages. And then for structural methods, we wanted to see, is there a really cheap way to do this? So for content length, we can just look at the HTTP headers to see um, how many bytes have changed. Um, and then it's also pretty easy to count the number of words. So we had the example here, we started out with 100 words and then went to 109. Even though the page changed dramatically, we're just looking at you know, how many words were there. And so this was a 9% increase uh, in the number of words. If we go here to where you get an error page, the number of words is going to significantly decrease. So it went down to five words. And that's a 95% um, decrease, so negative 0.95 uh, in our example. So we built a gold standard data set to evaluate uh, these six methods. And we went through and we picked three uh, archivate collections, Occupy, Egyptian Revolution and Politics, and the Columbia University Human Rights Collection. Um, these are all pretty large collections, so we sampled CDRIs from them, and then we sampled uh, mementos from those. But we still ended up with 15,000 mementos that we manually labeled, or I should say, yes, mean manually labeled. Um, and uh, we have these uh, manually labeled sets. If any of you are interested, Alex, for the human rights one, you can uh, email us and we'd be happy to share that with you. But right now, uh, the format we have is just a, a text format and label one means it's on topic, label zero means it's off topic. Um, in our future work, we want to make this be kind of an annotated or extended time map format so it's a bit more uh, machine readable. So we evaluated these six methods at 21 different thresholds from zero to one. And like I said before, we assumed the first memento was on topic. Um, we also combined two methods um, using OR to find the best combination method, and that gave us 15 different uh, test combinations. And then we averaged the results at each threshold over the three test collections. We looked at five different metrics here, uh, false positives, false negatives. Yes, I always forget which is which. This is a very helpful image. Um, in, in our case, false positives are on topics that are labeled as off topic. False negatives are off topics labeled as on topics. And so then we also looked at accuracy, F1 score, uh, and the AUC, the area under the rock curve. And that's looking at the false positive rate versus the true positive rate. Um, and basically, higher is better. So what we found is that cosine similarity performed really well. Um, for the, the best single method, if you're only going to use one, we found for these uh, collections, cosine with a threshold of 0.15. So if the uh, pages had a 0.15 similarity or higher, we said these are on topic. If it's 0.15 similarity or lower, these are probably off topic. Um, and since we manually labeled these, we could compute the false positives and the false negatives. And we ended up uh, with an AUC score of uh, 0.961. Um, these are sorted by the, the F1 score. And so we got uh, pretty high measures for all of these. When we combined two methods, uh, cosine com combined with word count, 
uh, uh, worked out as the best overall method. Uh, the nice thing about this one is that, again, word count is really easy, right? Once we've done all the stuff to be able to compute cosine similarity, we essentially just have to count the words, and so we can combine those relatively cheaply. So then the next thing we wanted to do was let's test out this cosine word count method. Um, and so we're going to look at other archivate collections. So we picked 11 archivate collections. Um, and they were uh, range, governmental, event-based, theme-based. They had time spans of one week to seven years, um, some small and some really large. And so what we, what we have is we ended up with an average precision of 0.92 on these 11 archivate collections. And, and uh, I'll just uh, break this down here with the, with the pointer. These, um, in this top section, actually um, had a precision of one. So we detected uh, these number of off-topic uh, mementos, and we manually looked at all of those. And we confirmed that, though, yes, those were all off-topic. So that's zero false positives. Um, we cannot detect the false negatives because we didn't look at every single one of these thousands of mementos, but at least this gives you a, a starting point. Um, and then down here at the bottom, our algorithm detected no uh, off-topic mementos, um, which, you know, we hope is good, right? Um, and then the ones in the middle, uh, there were uh, several off-topic mementos, and we did identify a few false positives here. Um, another thing I want to mention is I have in this table uh, the affected URIRs or the affected seeds because you could have one bad seed, right, that gives you lots of off-topic mementos. And so we wanted to look at how widespread are these off-topic mementos in the collections. So just to, to summarize kind of what we did for this study, um, we looked at these six methods to look at similarity uh, between mementos in a time map. Um, tested them on a gold standard data set from three archivate collections, and then evaluated the best approach on 11 diverse archivate collections. And so we found that combining cosine similarity at threshold 0.10 and change in size using word count at threshold negative 0.85 gives the best performance. Um, and so again, the change in size using word count, this threshold means that if between the first memento and your candidate memento, the candidate memento the word count decreased by more than 85%, then it's likely off topic. Um, and then we uh, got 0.92 average precision on these 11 archivate collections. So we built a tool so you can use this. Um, so we have a Python uh, command line tool. Uh, it right now just does cosine similarity and it uses our best default threshold um, at point 15 for that. Um, and it oper operates on live time maps. So we'll go to archive it and, and actually grab the time map. Um, and it's available on GitHub. Here's an example with the uh, Maryland State Document Collection. Um, you can uh, actually just specify the archive it collection ID here and then the threshold. You can change it if you would like. Uh, and it goes and grabs the seed list and downloads the time maps and downloads the mementos and then we'll uh, print out for those that it thinks are off topic the similarity score in the URI. And uh, my uh, note here states that, so this Maryland State Docs, if you noticed in our evaluation, we said it had zero off topic mementos. Uh, but this test was run in late 2013 and 2014, which is uh, after uh, the data set that we have local to ODU. So there are new off-topic mementos in that collection. The um, other thing we'll, we can allow with this tool is that you can pick a single time map and uh, detect off-topic pages. So then this uh, allows you to look at time maps not necessarily in archive it. So this will be any time map that's uh, way back uh, capable this should work for. Um, and so it downloads these and then prints out the, the similarity and the, the URI. Um, and so just to uh, state again, we don't remove anything. We don't touch your collections. We are just offering a list of potential things you might want to look at uh, if you uh, want to kind of call your, your collection. 
So we're continuing uh, to work on this. We're going to uh, add some enhancements to our tool. We're going to add the other similarity methods. Word count will be the first one we add. Um, the other thing we want to allow is for you to be able to run this on your local CDX and work files if you have your, your own local repository. Um, we also want to look at what are the characteristics of the collections and the time maps that affects choosing these thresholds. So we didn't want to create, you know, here's the best threshold for the Egyptian revolution one, here's the best one for human rights. We wanted some threshold and method that would work you know, reasonably well for lots of collections, but there may be something we can discover that would help you kind of fine tune uh, these for your particular collection. Um, and then kind of farther out, we want to look at detecting off-topic seeds in a collection. So uh, maybe you've had um, people suggest seeds to you and, you know, you have a lot of seeds and you haven't been able to go through and look at them all to see if they really fit your collection or not. Can we use this type of tool to figure out, uh, you know, are these seeds that you should uh, include or not? And so that's involved with determining the uh, aboutness of the entire collection rather than a time map. So again, I um, thank you and again, we, we are, are grateful for your support. And I'll do a, a quick plug. We just found out on yes, Friday uh, that this paper uh, from the result of this work was accepted at TPDL. And we'll be presenting that uh, later in the fall. So thanks. How long did the algorithm take to run when you're doing a for like the data set? Because I presume uh, cosine similarity does take a while to run when you're doing it on a large collection. I would have to ask Yasmin about that in okay. terms of, yeah, because she, she ran the experiment, so I don't know how long um, okay. it took, yeah. And I, I don't know if uh, Ms. Yasmin has uh, considered, but I saw uh, the kernel-based search was pretty interesting. Um, it, it could be coupled with the LDA for topic detection as well as the NER for named entities and that could also be matched to find the similarities between docs. That's just a suggestion. I don't know if that's been Right, done. right. And I think that may be um, helpful also when you're looking at the entire collection. Mm -hmm. um, because, yeah, we're considering that, you know, for a particular time map, hopefully the terms are not going to change too much. Mm -hmm. But when we move to a collection, it may be much broader. And so we may need to do some more, okay. you know, kind of a broader analysis when we look at all the seeds in a collection. Okay. The other thing to mention is that you could uh, use this tool with what Nat presented because you want to get the off-topic mementos out of your collection before you do your thumbnail summarization. Uh, what are the consequences if the assumption that the first memento is actually on topic proves to be false? Um, so you'd probably get a, a long list of, uh, you know, not uh, of, uh, of off-topic mementos. And so one thing that we could, um, this would require work, you know, a bit of cooperation from the curator to kind of figure out at what point did your time map actually go on topic. Um, the, one, the examples that we filmed are basically the seed got added before the site was really live and so you'd get kind of the Apache default page. Um, and so, you know, we could add a, you know, a switch in the code that lets you specify, okay, don't start looking until the fifth memento or, or whatever. But yeah, you basically you just want to reset it to what is really zero. Michelle, why didn't you use sim hashes in this work? Because Matt was using sim hashes throughout and you didn't. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly why we uh, picked these. Um, so the, the thing is, is that if you want to detect we wanted to stay with terms rather than just kind of character differences so that, you know, because we're trying to do what is the topic of the page rather than, um, you know, did they just get rearranged? So I think trying to keep these into, into terms fits this particular uh, goal better. 